Hi, I am Faris Ahdab. I am a research fellow and assistant professor of medicine at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. What I'll be talking about here is a fundamental concept in the field of evidence-based medicine, and that is the hierarchy of evidence in the medical literature and the biomedical literature, and what is commonly referred to as the evidence pyramid. Now, a pyramid has expressed the idea of hierarchy of medical evidence for so long that basically that not all evidence is the same. The principle became well known in the early 1990s as practicing physicians learned basic clinical epidemiological skills and started to appraise and apply the medical evidence that was coming up in their practice. Since evidence was described as a hierarchy, the compelling rationale to use a pyramid to visualize that was made at the time. And since then, several versions of this pyramid have been described, but all of them focus on showing weaker study designs at the bottom. And most of these were like basic science research, in vitro studies, and followed by, by uh, case reports and case series, and that is followed by case controls and then cohort studies. And then there's the uh, uh, sort of the, the, the desired and very uh, appreciated design of randomized control trials. And then at the very top, there's the systematic reviews and meta-analyses. And although this is, um, there's a lot of truth to this. I mean, it, this does make sense in many instances, but we do have a lot of uh, uh, challenges that we think um, as the authors of, of a paper that I will be describing in a bit where the citation is here at the bottom um, where we think this might not be true and and a careful consideration should be taken into account. The This traditional pyramid was deemed too simplistic at many times thus the importance of leaving room for some argument and counter argument for specifically the methodological merits of different study designs um, was made. And other barriers other than that are about challenging the placement of systematic reviews and meta-analyses at the very top of this pyramid. For instance, heterogeneity, which can take the form of uh, and can be caused by clinical heterogeneity, methodological heterogeneity, or statistical heterogeneity, is basically inherent in, in almost every meta-analysis and systematic review. It's basically one of the basic limitations of, of systematic reviews. And heterogeneity can be minimized or explained, but it will never really be eliminated. It just cannot be completely eliminated. It's always going to be there. So that is one aspect. And the other aspect is that methodological intricacies and dilemmas of systematic reviews could potentially result in uncertainty and error. We therefore suggest, in this perspective here, two visual modifications to this basic form of uh, the pyramid of evidence to illustrate these two concepts that we are trying to emphasize. So this older concept has always been there. It's very common. Um, it's, it's many times it's taken for granted and, and it is taught um, and is just taught as a given like, with, without even um, doubting it or, or sort of questioning the basic concepts behind it. In here we'll try to challenge that, uh, that school of thought. Um, and many institutions and, and, and universities are still teaching this old uh, version up until now, still. The paper we had we had ri written about this and uh, published, it was published in the BMJ Journal of Evidence-Based Medicine. Um, we were really happy to, to still see that it is still among the very uh, top papers that, that are um, that are drawing attention to this concept. That's great. So in this paper, what we did basically is suggest these visual modifications, and I'll go through them in detail. So this is sort of a quick idea of what, what, what we suggested. To start with, let's start with the basic form of this uh, pyramid of evidence. So we changed, like I said, we, we suggested two changes, basically. The first one is due to the following. Study designs, these different study designs, appear to be insufficient on their own as a surrogate for judging risk of bias in these individual studies. So you can't really say that 
all cohort studies are better than case control studies. All randomized control trials are, are better than all cohort studies. So that is that is something we 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 think is not exactly correct. So uh, and just hear me out here. So study design is not a surrogate for risk of bias. Certain methodological limitations of, of individual studies, such as imprecision, inconsistency, indirectness of the outcomes measured and reported, these are factors independent from the study design itself, and these factors can affect the quality of evidence derived from any individual study. Therefore, the first modification to this pyramid that we suggested is to change these straight lines from straight lines into wavy lines, and that is to reflect the uh, the use of of uh, grading up and down the evidence depending on these aspects that I uh, these aspects that I mentioned like the imprecision inconsistency indirectness and some other factors that can um, can lead you to judge a study as good quality as higher higher quality and as low quality of evidence and that is independent of its study design. Of course, study design is taken into consideration, but basically the message here is that it is not the only factor that, that can be used to judge the risk of bias in any single study. So, what that looks like now is like this. Just look at the, at the lower part here. These wavy lines reflect the idea that some cohort studies are better than case control studies, but some con case control studies can be better than some cohort studies. Same thing here is that where some cohort studies can actually be better than some randomized controlled trials. There are so many actual examples in the literature, but just to give an idea about an example here, consider a, a, a cohort study that is large, that is well conducted in terms of the selection of the uh, participants in that uh, cohort study, how how selection bias was was reduced a lot was uh, elim well not eliminated but was taken care of very well and for example if there were uh, very good methods to ascertain the outcomes and to make sure that the exposures were actually uh, valid and and were actually present in in the groups that were being evaluated in this large cohort study now compare that to a small randomized control trial that that is not blinded, that does not have allocation concealment, and that, that could possibly have some other uh, factors that could drive down the quality of the evidence and there, therefore drive up the risk of bias in that randomized control trial. Now, in that instance, that cohort study is better than that randomized control trial. So this is the idea behind these wavy lines. The other aspect is basically to remove the, the systematic reviews from the top and to use them to you to use them to look at the available literature and the available evidence. So another challenge to the notion of having systematic reviews at the top of evidence of, of this pyramid is that a meta-analysis of well-conducted randomized controlled trials at low risk of bias really cannot be equated with another meta-analysis of observational studies at higher risk of bias. So the systematic review and, a meta and the meta-analysis relies to a lot, very large extent to the quality of evidence that you include in that systematic review. And if you include poor quality of evidence, then systematic review would therefore show poor quality of evidence. And then if, if you include higher quality of evidence and low risk of bias studies in the systematic review, then of course you're going to get in the systematic review eventually higher quality of evidence and lower risk of bias. But then systematic views then of different uh, quality of the included studies are not really equal. They're not the same. So systematic views are not always at the top. That's basically the point. So we did make this change to remove systematic views from the top of the pyramid and use them as a lens or a tool through which other types of studies should be seen like appraised and applied. So the systematic review, which is the process of selecting the studies to be included here to answer a specific question, and meta-analyses that are done with systematic views most of the time, which are statistical aggregations, uh, basically a statistical method to aggregate the, produced, uh, the, the, the reported uh, findings to produce a single effect size. These two 
study design, semantic reviews, and meta-analyses, they are basically tools to consume the evidence and to apply the evidence to patients or to, 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 to make uh, uh, policy decisions based on this evidence or, or to make uh, clinical decisions for patients. So the, the take-home message from this is that changing how systematic reviews and meta-analyses are perceived by patients, clinicians, and policymakers has important implications. Take an example, the American Heart Association uh, method of, of rating up and down the evidence. So the AHA considers, considers evidence derived from meta-analyses to have a level A. Straight up, if it's meta-analyses, then, then they just give it a level A, which basically warrants the most confidence in the findings. However, re-evaluation of evidence using the GRADE approach, the GRADE framework, shows, and it did actually show too, that the level A evidence by the AHA could actually have uh, high, moderate, low, or even very low quality, but they still get a level A. So the quality of evidence drives the strength of recommendation, which is one of the last translational steps of research most proximal to patient care and application in the, in the, in the clinical setting. This pyramid can also be used as a teaching tool EBM teachers can compare it to the existing pyramids to explain how certainty in the evidence, also called quality of evidence, is evaluated. It can be used to teach how evidence-based practitioners can appraise and apply systematic views in practice and to demonstrate the evolution of EBM thinking and modern understanding of certainty in the evidence. Thank you for listening, and if you have any questions, please tweet them or uh, comment below. I will put a link to the study below in the comments uh, to this to this video. Thank you very much.